Okay, good morning. I'm Rick Usher. I'm Assistant City Manager for Small Business and Entrepreneurship. And this morning, um, we have a panel discussion on emerging innovation districts in Kansas City. Um, we have Malika Robinson with Eastside Collaborative, Kevin McGinnis with the uh, newly announced Keystone District, and uh, Nicole Bob, Maker Village, to uh, kind of have a discussion of what's going on. But then I'd like to, like, we'll, we'll talk for maybe 20 minutes, but then I'd like to break up in a couple of groups as you're thinking about, you know, what we've been talking about, how uh, innovation is, is coming up in Kansas City, you know, what you're seeing and what maybe helps make neighborhoods where uh, entrepreneurship and innovation are happening, what makes them thrive. So I've got a couple boards around the room, and I'll throw some markers at you, and we'll uh, work together on that. So um, the map that's on the monitor here, uh, I've, uh, I've sent a uh, link out through my Twitter account, uh, at RUKCMO. It's a map that I've been using for about four, four or five years now, just as uh, we're seeing co-working spaces, um, innovative businesses, um, incubators, accelerators, uh, activity around entrepreneurship coming up all over Kansas City. Um, Trying to keep a list of that was fine, but then really trying to visualize where in the city and then what's helping those things happen in the city um, with the map has been useful for me. Um, so um, everything I put on here as far as, I'm using the phrase emerging because there are a lot of definitions of the innovation <laughs> district that we'll, we'll talk about. And uh, that's uh, kind of what, what I, uh, have been on this. So I'd like to start with um, Nick, and uh, I've also I've written an article about as I'm doing this research how coffee shops fuel innovation and entrepreneurship in Kansas City. So I first met Nick at Pogo's Coffee Shop on Southwest Boulevard about was that 45 years ago. Yeah, yeah, 45 years. And uh, so Nick was there talking about his Maker Village movement. Um, Bo Nelson was there with a bag of coffee. Like, I want to roast coffee. And uh, these guys were talking about where they wanted to locate their businesses. So kind of long story short, you ended up on 31st Street. If you want to talk a bit about yeah, what's happening sure. in your neighborhood? Yeah, so at that meeting, um, Bo and Bill from Dominus and um, my partner and I were talking about buying a big building doing coffee and roasting on one side and then uh, community wood and metal shop on the other side. Mm -hmm. and, idea. Uh, <clears throat> and then Bill and Bo landed um, where they're at and you know they had a liquor license and a great um, great little space down off of 15th Street. And it took us a lot longer to find a spot. But uh, we bought an old building on uh, right at 31st and Cherry in the town. Uh, it was Kind of a blind area that people drove through, not much to stop for. Um, the exception, um, I think what Rick was referring to is uh, the, the coffee shop uh, and filling station. Everybody knows where filling station is at, so 29th and, and we know. Um, so that, you know, Rachel, um, who owns that, was very early there, and that kind of helped create a little bit of energy in the neighborhood. Um, and then the 816 Bike Collective, um, a lot of building, um, the Two-Tone Press, which is now Print Lee KC, is a community uh, letterpress shop. You can do letterpress, you can fix your bike, and now if you make a village, you can you know, learn woodworking and metalworking. So we have those you know, three kind of, uh, I wouldn't call them anchors, but three uh, you know, unique businesses that have some social uh, impact and, and social entrepreneurship in mind. It's more uh, business for the people. It's not a, a scalable, high net worth business. It's a, it's a small, small business. Uh, so uh, yeah, that's that's kind of where we're, uh, there's a lot more to dive into, but um, we've really been working on um, communication within the neighborhood. Uh, we've got big developers, we've got People have been there for a long time um, uh, who are not necessarily interested in the same things uh, that millennials are interested in or that people who live in cities 
are interested in like walkability. Um, there are small businesses that look at everything as though it's going to be a tax and it's going to reduce their bottom line and um, they have no forward facing you know, retail or, or anything that would really uh, benefit them. So kind of balancing that with also big developers that are coming in wanting to build high rise apartments and how do you balance, you know, not gentrifying, not pushing people out um, with balancing with new developers, the small businesses like ourselves. Um, and so, you know, we've been trying to come up with good ideas for that. I think we're doing an okay job. Uh, so I'll try to pass along that. Uh, Kevin, you're, you're, you're taking kind of a more uh, like a larger scale approach to innovation. I just want to tell us a bit about Keystone. And yeah. Uh, thanks, Rick. Um, so, first, I'll just say, you know, I think there's a lot of great work that's happening. When you look at the map, there's a lot of assets across the region. I think one of the things when I started this project, and it's had multiple iterations and multiple lives over time, but really started this project in earnest in January of this, this calendar year. Um, and it's pretty kind of my hands. Uh, I've gone to Civic Council. Casey Rising, talked to them about the 20 year uh, economic development plan. They've been on an innovation and entrepreneurship work group uh, in that organization. We were really looking at how can innovation and entrepreneurship move the needle on a regional basis in Kansas City. And so we started to look at really what are the gaps. When you look at cities that have um, innovation clubs or innovation as part of the culture for their economies and part of the things that are really driving new business starts. Uh, higher household median income, uh, number of quality jobs, uh, that are driving those types of factors. What, are, what is it about these cities that stands out and how you've been trying to think of cities and some cities? And one of the things that, that stood out as we started to look at the gaps, one, I think this map is a really good illustration of one of the problems we have in Kansas City, quite honestly. There are a lot of really small things that are doing really good things, but they're very spread out. Um, and we have a tremendous amount of uh, work that is spread out over a large geography. So when you're looking at it on a regional basis, and you're looking at it as someone who's trying to determine whether or not you're going to invest in this community and bring external dollars in, when your business is going to invest here, um, whether your talent, it's really about competition between cities for talent right now. Um, if you're looking at, um, is Kansas City a destination for you uh, in terms of high growth jobs and some of the things that you reference um, in terms of uh, high growth, high tech, those types of things. Where do you go? Where is place in Kansas City? Um, a lot of other innovation centers, innovation cities, when you um, say St. Louis, Cortex, you say Boston, Kendall Square, when you say Atlanta, Tech Square, there are things that are synonymous with innovation in some of those regions. It doesn't mean it's the only thing, but it certainly doesn't mean it's, um, you know, it, it's something that trumps all and, and takes over uh, an ecosystem. But you need place. When you look at kind of the trends on a global basis over the last 20 or 30 years, location is really becoming critical. And when I say location, I am talking about a, a scale, a magnitude scale difference than some of the innovation nodes and some of the local innovation communities and some of the things that we have in the city right now. So we are focusing on something that's a little bit larger um, and a long, longer term project. Well, I'm not sure, quite sure what I signed up for when I signed up for it. Um, uh, so started down that path in January. Um, looked at a lot of research and studies on placemaking, on what is about these innovation districts as they're defined by Brookings Institute, Virginia Tech School of Real Estate, a lot of academic definitions. I think Rick mentioned this right up front. There are a lot of different views of what an innovation district is, um, and we're taking a somewhat academic approach about it. It has to be, um, there has to be a certain kind of critical mass. Um, you can reference anchor institutions. The anchor institutions in some of these larger innovation districts, typically universities. Um, university research, workforce development programs, the kind of universities, those types of things. We like an R1 Research University in Kansas City. Uh, no offense to UMKC, Chancellor Agarwal is part of the initiative that, that I'm working on. Um, but we lack that critical mass related to um, uh, related to an innovation district. So um, again, traveled the country, visited a lot of these innovation districts, kind of came up with some best practices, what we thought would be um, a blueprint for how Kansas City can develop its own, with its own characteristics, place its own strengths, really look at 
kind of an asset based on the community development view of what an innovation district could be in Kansas City, and that's what kind of led us down this path. I will say the last thing um, that I'll mention is Kansas City is a real estate market. Uh, most mm -hmm. cities are, um, but Kansas City has a very uh, distinct culture as it relates to real estate development, commercial real estate development in particular. Um, and so we wanted to remove location from the uh, from the, the equation as quickly as possible. Because innovation districts aren't about real estate development. They're real estate development projects, and they're not about the real estate. They're not about proximity and co-location alone. It is about programming. So one of the things we wanted to do was evaluate, and I said, this is a regional project. This is not about any one community. Uh, it will end up in a neighborhood. It will end up in a community. We have to be conscious of that. We have to protect um, those key assets and the, the people who live there. Um, but this is a larger real estate project or a larger regional project. So we looked at 12 different areas around Kansas City. We evaluated those against kind of best practices around placemaking, best practices around where innovation districts can thrive. Uh, and really, uh, this 18th Street corridor that we've selected between the East Crossroads and 18th and Vine um, really is an ideal location regionally uh, for a development like this, uh, for something like this. So that's why we selected that area. So first of all, I'd like to point out we're standing here all <laughs> Thank you for everyone uh, attending here. And so, so Kevin touched on you know, real estate. I think so, Malika. Like you and I share this recognition of the value of libraries. And for me, um, I'm not looking for a real estate deal when I'm out trying to support the entrepreneur community. And that was really how how uh, Eastside Collaborative uh, started. You, can you give us a little background on Eastside Collaborative and your goals? And so, um, <clears throat> Eastside Collaborative started out as, as, of a need to find a safe space for other users. <clears throat> so, where's that space? Where, where's the, I guess you said, the, the front door for the Black entrepreneurship? And we don't have one. And so, the goal for Eastside Collaborative is to create that space. And it's interesting because I've, I've known it for a long time. I'm um, starting with the, some of the people that provide work on um, the committee um, that is on the library. And he started making this map. So when I first pitched the idea of Eastside Collaborative, one of the things I talked about was this map. And the fact is, we do have some of these, um, I guess, organically created um, innovation places. But the interest that I'm, it's called Eastside Collaborative because we're talking about use of truth. And so the interest that I had was, where is those? Where is that space on the east side of Truce? And if you look at the map, it makes it look like there is an innovation desert. And we know that that's not there. But there's not a place for those people that are in those neighborhoods to come and collaborate and start to kind of build upon our ideas. And that's the idea of the side collaborative. That's the goal of creating space like that. And I think there's a there's a good reason for that too. We can build upon the ideas of the Keystone District and the other organically created innovative places because once you have a space, you can start to connect some of those pieces that are people who are not currently connected to any part of the larger entrepreneurial community once you have a space like that. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's really the goal and how you And so you, you do make a good point because part of Tracking the geography of where entrepreneur activity is happening and where uh, we might call the innovation activity taking place. As I've been mapping that, you can't see what, what Monica has pointed out. So for me, in, in the city manager's office, when the Prospect Business Association was formed, um, that gives me an immediate location to engage with a number of uh, small business owners in that neighborhood through, through one organization. Much easier to work with a business association than with individual business owners. Um, they have uh, an economic development uh, group and they're working with uh, KCATA on the implementation of Prospect Max that will be coming. Uh, what I've mapped um, are the footprints of the Urban Neighborhood Initiative and the Central City Economic Development Sales Tax zone and um, and then like I said the Prospect Business Association. Um, we also have uh, uh, D. Weiser Dixon in the room who has uh, 
I'm sorry, you hit him. Uh, who, who's been um, championing Enterprise Village, which would be south of, uh, of the 18th and Vine. Um, and that uh, takes advantage of, of some redevelopment that, that, would, that would need to take place in order to pour. Um, so what uh, other, other things I've highlighted on here <coughs> is if you look at the Crossroads neighborhood, uh, that, that neighborhood, um, and this is a kind of a fuzzy statistic I picked up from the Tennessee Area Development Council, so, you know, don't try to real-time verify my facts, but what, what I'm being told is that there are, this was a few years ago, that there are like 56 or 58 digital media companies in the state of Missouri, and with the Downtown Council and KCADC going through uh, like the, the NAICS codes for business organization, they found 54 of them are located in the Crossroads community. So it is a really hotbed of, of activity in, um, in that area. And so the idea of business clusters, there, there's back to that, that um, maybe you're in a neighborhood like Crossroads and, and like uh, Nick has created here at uh, 31st Street, um, you're going to run into people while you're out walking around lunch or the coffee shop that you're not the same company, but that might be that person that helps you move your idea to the next level. You're at a coffee shop, say the lead guy having coffee and somebody walks up and make an introduction. They're, those kind of introductions like, can't happen inside uh, your large corporation if everybody's even at the same cafeteria. So if you're out in a neighborhood where you're sharing uh, you know, public space, that's uh, kind of key. I think Brookings talks about that a bit. Can we step back a little bit? Yeah. I talk about what an innovation is. It's just kind of make sure everybody's on the to make sure people understand how much work it is. When we talk about what makes a strong district. And I don't know, maybe all of you guys know, but I know for me, some of this terminology is fairly new. So, Kevin, you've, you've researched and traveled to 10 cities. You want to give us a. Yeah, there's. Get us started on that part of Sure, I'll, I'll give it a shot. So, in, in what I've learned and, and what we've tried to consolidate from best practices around the country and, and really globally is that there's kind of six criteria for successful innovation. Um, the first one is programming is the North Star. It is not about the real estate. It is real estate development. Play. Oftentimes it gets, uh, encompasses real estate development, but it is really, it's not about co-location, it's about how do you tie people together with programming. So, programming. Yeah, programming. yeah thank you. Yeah. <laughs> um, I feel like I already five <laughs> um, So uh, programming, you have vertical clustering, industry clustering that might occur. You have research institutions, corporate innovation teams, entrepreneurs, and entrepreneurial programming that would happen. But how do you bring people together? So a good example for me around programming was an event we held at the Spring Accelerator a couple years ago around blockchain. I don't know if any of you got to attend that event. It was one of the most well-attended events that the Accelerator had done. And the reason why is because you had all these different industries that were represented in the room because they had a common interest around a technology. It wasn't that they were all developing it the same way. It wasn't that they were even all thinking about it the same way. They were all there on some topical interest, some um, you know, thing that brought them together. Then you started to see the conversations about, well, how are you thinking about it? How are you going to use it? What's it mean to you? Those types of things. And there were a lot of connections built in a community of interest around that. So there's community of interest programming, there's entrepreneurial programming, things like accelerators and incubators. Um, there's uh, events that you can start to create in, a, in an area. Um, if, if you guys know Davion Ross and Toby Rush, they're an interesting uh, dynamic as it relates to this conversation. Davion's company is down on 35, um, I think 67th or 87th Street in I-35. And Toby, when he um, created an office space for Iberico, I wanted to make sure they were in the crossroads. And there was a key difference between the two. One was, um, you know, <coughs> Davion wanted to be out of the mix and not in a place where there would be distractions. And he wanted to find cheap real estate for this company. 
Toby wanted to maybe pay a little bit more, but wanted to be somewhere where if he wanted to walk to programming, wanted to walk mm -hmm. to an event, wanted his employees to have access, there's kind of there's some proximity around it. So that's those are some examples of programming. Programming has to be the guy. The, number two um, is really uh, it has to be um, about half of the innovation districts in the country have been built next to low income populations. About half of those, or over half of those, is because the cost of the land was cheap. There are other innovation districts that have built uh, inclusion with diversity programming and really have an eye on inclusive prosperity. And they did that right out of the gate in terms of why they located where they did it. You can probably guess the difference in success for the two innovation districts. The ones that aren't encouraging community engagement, aren't about inclusivity, uh, diversity, those types of things, aren't as successful as the ones who manage it proactively and, and manage and focus on community engagement. So that's number two. Um, number three is really around the design of the district itself. Um, well, actually, number two or number three is really how do you define the region's campfire, the thing that's going to bring people together in the region. Um, and so our campfires are really going to be, I think Rick touched on it, design. When you look at the top trade sector in Kansas City in terms of where we export services and import revenue into the area, it's global architecture. So our global architecture companies, HLK, Populous, uh, you know, our engineering firms, Black and Beach firms, McDonald construction firms, that AEC cluster is really a good one. But it also goes into graphical design. Kansas City has a strong history in product design. Design thinking, human-centered design is really the root and the core of kind of entrepreneurial thinking. So how do we make this innovation? How do we make Kansas City's campfire about design? We build an area or design programming around that design. So find the campfire. Um, programming is key. Inclusive inclusion and diversity have to be at the forefront. And then the, the last three are really about the design of the district itself. And these are the criteria where I think you start to get into the definitional differences of what an innovation district is and isn't. This is what Brookings has some pretty firm things around critical mass. So density and scale have to be part of the equation. In order for you to move the needle on an economic development perspective, you see you need a certain amount of density and scale. And you need to make sure that um, the project that we're working on is a 10 to 15 year planning and development life cycle. Not just an overall life S curve of the district itself, hopefully that lasts for a long, long time, but just to get this right, it's going to take 10 to 15 years. And you have to put it in a place where you can support density and scale. Um, I'll give you an example. The areas of the 31st Street area, Westport Commons is an area. When you look at Midtown Atlanta, um, where Tech Square is located, it's one square mile. It's about the same footprint of what we're talking about for DSO. From two, January of 2015 until the end of 2018, they're going to net add 17,500 jobs. 17,500 net new jobs in that one square mile. You have to be able to support businesses moving in that area. You have to be able to support the creation of space to allow for that kind of um, scale to occur. Um, if you don't have that footprint and you don't have that opportunity, then you create issues with gentrification because you have to move residential, you have to move people out of the way to create economic benefit for a larger region that's kind of counterproductive. So density and scale, proximity and connectivity has to be designed to connect people. You have to have those elements in the district, walkable, um, mass, mass transit uh, oriented and available. All of those are key criteria for an innovation district. And then the last one, um, and the one that I've learned the most about is governance and leadership. Um, these are multi-institution in Kansas uh, City. It's going to have to be by state because um, these are regional projects. Multiple cities are involved, multiple, multiple anchor institutions. So you have to have the right governance structure in place. You have to put the right leadership in place. If any of you are from St. Louis or familiar with Cortex, <coughs> it opened in 2002. was pretty much not going well until 2010 when they decided that they needed this run by Board of Regents, um, and they decided that they needed to hire an executive director that could lead them. That, that had a vision and wanted to do something different or had a vision for what Cortex could be done. They hired Dennis Lower. He made some pretty quick decisions about what Cortex was and wasn't. And since then, it's been on a, a very, uh, a much different trajectory. And so those are like yeah. key, key, I think, elements of a successful innovation district. Um, when you, and, and I'm sorry, I was looking at your Twitter there because uh, there's a lot of activity going on, but <laughs> did, you, did you mention the spring accelerator? I mentioned it a bit. So when, <laughs> right, when, when, when Kevin uh, opened this pretty accelerator, there was a panel discussion around with Mayor James, and uh, you made the statement, we opened the pretty accelerator in the crossroads because the campus isn't conducive to innovation. 
I believe the quote was, uh, the campus is where startups go to die. <laughs> so, uh, I still believe that was it. So, uh, Nick, so your, your effort, I don't know how intentional you've been on it, but if this area of Kansas City, 31st Street, basically Forest, maybe over to Gillum, north to 27th down to 31st, there are a lot of what I would call you know, maker type businesses and social entrepreneurship ventures. Um, you just kind of need a neighbor moving across the street, but can you kind of tell what has drawn people to the neighborhood to this idea? And, well, and the branding, I, I like the branding too. So. Yeah, um, well, Kevin, I feel like he's operating <laughs> Way up here. I'm, I'm down here at the, at the street level, you know, um, and, and with a much smaller group. Uh, so um, that was that was really um, a, a good kind of thousand foot view, and you know how the how the mission districts uh, came work. Um, my lens is through uh, the maker world. So um, you know, there. Then the first time I ran across the innovation district um, word was in a book called Maker City Project. Um, it's a good book. Um, there's a chapter on um, uh, innovation districts, and it really talks about like infrastructure, physical prototyping, um, community engagement, all those things um, on a neighborhood level, it's not a not a regional level, but on just a, a strictly neighborhood level. But it involves the you know, the city because you need um, you know planning, you need approval for permitting, and all those things. So. Um, and I'll get to your question, your question, but sorry, I just wanted to get this out there uh, as it relates to innovation districts and, and why I'm here. Um, so what we started to do is um, work with our neighborhood anchors and who happen to be design build um, uh, companies like Square One Studio. Amazing. Uh, they've never heard of them until I moved into the neighborhood and they're fantastic. Um, and we you know, work with uh, Printly, which is the community print shop, uh, like the Bike Collective, uh, Oddities Prints, which is a, 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 a print shop in our neighborhood, and started coming up with ideas of how um, we can kind of change the infrastructure to slow down traffic. That was like our, our, everybody was on the same page, like, what do we need to do? We need to slow down traffic so we can walk across the street and not feel like we're going to get hit by a bus. Four buildings in our neighborhood have been hit by trucks or buses in the last four years. So you can see like you go and look at buildings, you see a big metal strapping and the, the buildings have been like punctured it's because cars fly along the 31st Street quarter uh, quarter because it's an artery. Um, I understand that. Um, the Mid America Regional Council did a study, 31st Street was one of the most dangerous corridors in the city. Uh, so <clears throat> it's a top five uh, you know hot in big in the city. So our one of our kind of Things like we don't agree on everything, but this is one thing we can really all get behind. Um, and and so, how do we slow down traffic? So uh, we started um, working on traffic calming, working with Bike Walk KC, which is a nonprofit, um, doing <coughs> little things, working with the city planners um, and uh, public works, and apply for uh, a PIAC uh, application to do some things, um, do phone files. So what's PIAC? Um, Plan Improvement Area Council, I think. Um, no, so that's public improvement. public improvement Area Council. Thank yeah, you. I just want to clarify. Yeah. Public Improvement Advisory Council is a Thank funding you. for public infrastructure that the city council manages. And you can, as a resident, you can propose infrastructure funding. So I just want to clarify yeah, that. Thank one. you. Thank you. Um, so, mm -hmm. in, in, increasing density for parking and also narrowing the, the, the streets so that it's really clear that this is one lane and not two lanes. And, you know, Again, kind of, that's just kind of some uh, uh, encouraging traffic calming. If the if the lanes aren't super wide, then you don't feel like it's a super highway. And if it's a little narrower, as it should be, you can increase your parking with reverse angle or ripper parking, and you can also slow down traffic. So um, we also did a project where we built um, 25,000 pound concrete planters um, with the idea of building benches off of the side, bike racks. With little free libraries, um, and that's kind of the the, the concrete planter was um, also closer to the curb, so that the cars would, you know, not want to hit the hit the planter, so they park a little bit further off the street. So this is like 
you know, uh, ideas for traffic calming, how we can do that. So that was kind of our, uh, uh, you know, that's what brought us all to the table and, and increasing our uh, communication. And that's now led to like Wanderfest, which is a neighborhood um, uh, kind of party and ex exploration. So people come and see what's going on in the neighborhood, <coughs> um, which is in, in increasing collaborations. And um, you know, we have a lot of makers uh, uh, from the east side, from you know, downtown, all over. The so, and you got uh, a new neighbor, the Juice Market. Collective. Yeah, yeah, and, and I, I, I'm not sure if they're all the way moved in, but they've got some really good ideas, um, and I've heard some of those from KD, uh, from Fish Market Collective, and Dad and from All Caps, but I'm, I'm yeah, encouraged to see it, um, and it sounds like they're, they're doing it in an uh, extremely inclusive way, so, you know, yeah. So, we touched on enough, do you have some other definitional ideas through this because what what's interesting for me is when you're if like east side collaborative you, you started just by being a pop-up in public libraries now you're in public and public and coffee shops yeah so what happens in that environment why did you pick that model when i first uh, found out that the idea of co-working spaces i thought this is amazing because when you're in a space like that and kind of like what we're doing today you start to meet all kinds of different people and you can use what they call these um, collisions to create these relationships. And I thought, wow, this would be amazing for the black community. And I didn't see them in the spaces that I was going to. And so the idea was to pop up in these cafes, co working space, just to know more about the real estate of Kansas City and what's available, not just for coffee, for coffee, but also that there are resources available. And we got to have coffee and Wi Fi mm -hmm. and tables and some power. And then the Southeast Public Library said that we had a space. Um, mm -hmm. You want to come in and host it um, on a regular basis. So we did that for a while. And then we got the village on 47th, the troops is where we were for quite some time on Tuesday. So we, we were still kind of like a pop up co working space. And the mm -hmm. goal again is to create this um, mass of people that um, have a community and a place to be. Um, I'm interested in what's happening like in the prospect corridor because some of the things that Kevin is talking about are needed for an innovation district and everything, you know, I think that's great that they're creating that. But the organic piece of it is while we're, you know, working with places in PA to build up the transportation there, um, there's a lot of work about creating residential spaces mm -hmm. as well as commercial spaces. And I see that as also being a place where we can kind of concentrate some innovation. It's important though, while we're talking about creating innovative centers, that we also think about how to do the inclusion of us. Um, so it's not, it's not just about entrepreneurship, but also about the training of people so that they're ready to move into the world so that they can do creating, and not just in service capacity, but also in knowledge work. I think there's work to do around that to still, you know, make sure that the, the spaces that we're creating, the centers that the students are focusing on, are going to be successful. Anyone in the audience have questions for anyone? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Hello. Hello. Hi. Hi. So, um, I mean, I, I think this is kind of to all three of you, but for the most of you haven't. So, clearly, Kansas City has some organically occurring kind of hot spots happening. And then I think what you're talking about is almost like an artificially created density that you're, you're aiming to create. So my question is a two-parter. Once you know that starts getting built, what success metrics are you using um, as you, you know, job growth within the area, you know, things like that. And then the second part of it is how do success metrics in other areas that have successfully created an innovation district, how do those compare to those organically created districts? Uh, so the first part of that, um, there are dozens of key performance indicators that we're going to use to measure success. And they have a lot to do with anchor institute participation. So when I say anchor institutions, I want to go back to the four gaps in Kansas City. One is geographer, geo, geographically spread out with a lot of divisions in the city. 
that doesn't look like our peer cities. A lot of them are spread out, but very few of them are spread out and have the amount of divisions that we have that don't allow for collaborative scale. So that's number one. Number two is we lack corporate um, engagement and corporate collaboration. Uh, we rank near the bottom of our 30 peer cities in terms of corporate investment in the innovation ecosystem and the entrepreneurial ecosystem. Uh, we do not have an R1 research institution in the metro area. So how do we create use collaboration amongst our one the region to bring them all together. Uh, and then last, we have a two-sided workforce challenge in Kansas City. Every city, I don't care where you are at, they have a demand side problem. They have a problem around um, how do you put the right knowledge economy job, butts and seats to grow uh, high growth industries and participation into the emerging global gig economy. How do we put the right, um, you know, so everybody has a demand side challenge. Kansas City has two very large populations that left behind after each of the world wars. Uh, and have not been properly invested in terms of that workforce development to prepare them for knowledge economy if it's emerged. So all of our key performance indicators are going to be stacked up against kind of those four criteria. So how do we get our anchor institutions engaged? How do we engage them in programming and increase their level of participation? Universities, corporations. How do we create the right diversity indicators, not just around entrepreneurship, around workforce development, around skills uh, training. And that's one of the reasons that we want to create the future of work academy in the front as well. So, I, I mean, I, I could list them all off, but there's a lot of them. Your question about how do they benchmark against the smaller organic pieces, I do want, how many people know what Keystone is? I don't mean this to be. So, <laughs> no, not the pop top or the ski resort. So, um, so Keystone, for those of you who don't know, Keystone has two literal definitions. Uh, it is really kind of a key element that brings together an ecosystem. But from an architecture perspective, it's the last piece that's dropped into a stone arch that provides support and joins the two sides, right? From a biology perspective, which is also a cluster strength for Kansas City, our bio, bio nexus of uh, life sciences uh, area. From a biology perspective, a keystone is a species that exists within an ecosystem that actually optimizes that ecosystem. Think honeybees. There's been a lot of, I think there was a really popular gray wolves in Yellowstone when they reintroduced gray wolves in Yellowstone, how that really helped the larger ecosystem start to thrive. So the reason that this is called the Keystone District is the opportunity for us to help optimize a larger ecosystem through place. It's not to replace things, it's not to, we would like to see the key performance indicators, the benchmarks improve for everyone in the region, not try to replace those things. One, Key difference that I would say that we've seen between the law, the smaller nodes and organic developments that need to happen in a community versus, and, and I, it's funny, I've been describing this as we're building an artificial reef. We're going to build an artificial reef for 10 to 15 years and hopefully becomes a sustainable ecosystem around it. Um, but the goal of that is to try to, and the difference between a larger development like well, what we're talking about and the smaller ones is truly just the economic need. Is do we have the ability to see more high growth startups come out of the ecosystem? Do we have the ability to see workforce development more closer with industry and see more um, skills development, career transition services, see these things just scale where they can't scale sometimes in the smaller? Network? That's the key to that. Yeah, question. Um, I'm Patrick. Um, how are each of you organized, funded, and supported? I can start. Um, we're we're not we're a non-organization, <laughs> <laughs> so we pick up trash monthly. Um, we have a monthly email, um, and we uh, are are not formally organized. Um, funded, uh, we're not. Um, that we a, a lot of the say the concrete planters that we did, um, we. Kind of crowdsource that so that was money coming from every participating organization for main organizations or people which are couples you know um and uh, that was not from the city or from you know a, a non-profit or anything that was just kind of crowdsourced from the neighborhood and then um, supported also not supported other than you know people coming picking up trash communicating working together um you know we had all the drawings, um, for instance, for the PIAC um, uh, application. We did those ourselves because we had, you know, uh, a guy who was really good at vector drawing, also has an interest in um, 
urban planning, so we help us put those together. And um, so we're kind of, well, yeah, DIY, yeah, well, I guess. 501c3 nonprofit um, funded through a, a variety of different models. Um, on the development side, we have, I would say, large private institutional investors um, that want to invest in the initiative um, from a development perspective, the real estate development, land development, those types of things. Uh, on the programming side, um, there are a variety of models where we'll seek funding from grants to um, you know, at, at, we'll do lease capture amongst tenancy within the district. We'll do things to generate sustainable income uh, based on the boundaries that we draw and the things that we do within the district uh, and the members who participate. So think of it as a tenancy model. Um, the universities that will establish a presence, they will basically take space, you know, pay for space, long-term commitments to the space. The organization will get a percentage of, those, of that income in the most simple way to describe it. It will allow us to sustain programming and allow us to tie those people together in uh, the order. I think that's a great question. Um, Eastside Collaborative is a, a for profit mm -hmm. organization. What we're working on is a membership basis um, for entrepreneurs who want to belong to the organization. Um, I think it's a good question because the work mm -hmm. sometimes that some of us are doing is it's hard to find the right type of payment to sustain that type of work. Um, it's something we need to talk about. <coughs> When talking to institute to do that type of work because in order to make this innovation industry plus type of things thrive, we also have people who are out there and have to, you know, decide to be um, the people that are going to stand out and do it and volunteer their time. And I work at City Hall, so we're one of the largest crowdfunded organizations. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you. So, uh, more questions? Uh, yeah. How you guys talk about programming? Can you talk about some things that work well and that wouldn't make it? How do you make that better? I mean, we just ultimately some programming as well. Um, I can answer some of the questions. Yeah. 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 So you, you've had a few events and other you kind of been just something of value to is that collaborative for the craft more membership and I think it's interesting. I'm, I'm actually do you mind if I turn the question back to you? What are your thoughts about how programming has changed over time? Obviously you've been kind of watching it. Um I've seen very interesting kind of inclusive efforts. I've seen kind of more airdrop efforts. I've seen a little bit of everything over the years. Um, some things have staying power, some things don't. I think it just really depends what we're talking about. But from an organizational standpoint, I'm kind of curious how you know, the individual organization thinks that they're doing that they impact that landscape and then what does that landscape look like together. So, from my perspective, my goal with Eastside Collaborative was one, to create a program that was designed and focused on my target audience, which is black entrepreneurs. But also, with the idea of moving around to different co working spaces and coffee shops, is also to introduce to the broader macro entrepreneurial organization. So, this whole kind of GEW and take the sourcing and all that, I kind of bumped into it. Right. And so once you bump into it, you get into it, but there's a whole group of people who are not connected to it. And so when we talk about programming um, and being inclusive, that's 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 what Eastside Collaborative's perspective is. Of how do we one address a need that is out there, but also <coughs> widen, you know, widen the breadth of who we when we talk about entrepreneurship and things that we talk So, uh, you know, I think of our role in the programming world as kind of in three phases. From a planning perspective, how do we ensure that um, this is somewhat curated and planned in a way that um, allows for collisions, allows for proximity, <laughs> allows for those types of things, and, and allows for organic programming to sustain within the ecosystem. So things that pop up that happen that should be, we should actually foster more and more of that. There should be a lot of experimentation that happens from a programming perspective. Uh, 
on the development side, there will be some specific like C programming that we develop, and I mentioned technology focused programming, uh, accelerators, corporate engagement programming, mentorship programs. I mean, there's a, a variety of playbooks. Uh, eShip has done a lot of work around what some of this stuff should look like and could look like, and so we'll bring uh, a lot of that. And then on the operations side, uh, it's really how do we just connect? I, I think I've seen a really good example down in Atlanta in Tech Square for-profit entity that was created called Sandbox Communities. Um, and they use that as kind of a, um, a CRM for people that exist within the district or who are connected to the district. And it, it serves a couple different things. One, it allows people to become kind of become part of a community that's uh, been organically created around this innovation district. But then it also allows the people who are in that community to connect back to their home bases. So one of the strengths of Tech Square in Atlanta is that there's 15 corporate innovation teams that exist within there today. There's 19 more that will be added in March when Coda opens up their next high-rise building that's going to open up in Tech Square. Those 34 innovation teams, they're all all their corporate headquarters are about 20 miles from Tech Square, from a geography perspective in Atlanta. And so they created some really interesting programming that connects it back to the core businesses and corporations and really allows for that investment and that interest in those resources to easily plug in when they want to. So how do you create um, scalable teams? How do you create the density of conversations and problem solving and sharing and those types of things? So that's the from an operations perspective and one of these key performance indicators is how many people can we get down there uh, that are focused on some of the, the programming that we do in the career. Can I just add to what you're saying? I, um, I, I agree with you. There's, there hasn't been a lot of experimentation um, going on. Some things have fell off and some things have continued to sustain. I think that's the cool thing, right? Because we are entrepreneurs, right? So we do a lot of experimentation to see what works and what's not working. And we are developing, you know, this, and some things are going to fall off. <laughs> and so, um, yeah, I agree with you. Um, I'd like to see how this. You know, it eventually kind of organizes itself. But that is what we're doing. Um, for the Tower East District, um, some of the neighborhood programming is you know, picking up track, monthly meeting, talking about issues, uh, how we can uh, grow, um, change for the better, uh, if needed. And, uh, you know, forming and pouring 25 concrete uh, planters, you know, so everybody who's coming to pitch in and help out, uh, prototyping those. And, you know, filling them with sand and aggregate and dirt, and then after planting, you know, plants and educating ourselves on, you know, native uh, species and how to you know, map over water and film and stuff like that. So, so, so you said Tower East. Uh -huh. Tell us a bit more about that. Well, it's just the name of the neighborhood that um, the two sisters from Tucum Press, um, they were tired of us not having uh, a name, or, you know, so they were like, I'm, I'm taking a hold of the email list and I'm emailing everybody and we're going to figure out a name for, for our area. Um, again, we're not, um, we're not organized, um, we're not you know, registered with the city in any way, it's just what we call ourselves. Um, so the Tower East District is what ultimately came out of that process. Um, and you, Michelle, wouldn't take no from anybody and they, they rock, rock it, which is awesome. Um, and then people who aren't from Kansas City, what's the significance? Oh, sorry, the big red tower. We're east. Casey Long Tower. Yeah, yeah we're, we're east of the big, big, yeah, Casey PT uh, Tower. And that, that was interesting for me because when I was mapping this, I kind of put a box around it and said, this looks like, I think I just called it Maker Village. Yeah. And then this is this is open. You can go in here and add stuff to it. So they changed the name to 31st Street DIY. Yeah. <laughs> and then they had uh, Maker Fest. Now, Wanderfest yes. and then the Tower East name came up. So it really is. Um, I, I have a uh, kind of a, a shop local KC roundtable of business associations, and you really represent that totally grassroots idea. When you don't have a business association yet, you don't have a CID, but you're able to collaborate with that group of folks that are more experienced, like Main Core and yeah. others. Yeah, and Wanderfest is another good example of programming. It's annual, uh, and Cherry Pit, our neighbor, put all the work into that, all the branding, reaching out to all the makers, all the vendors, um, and it really created a staple in our neighborhood. And 
you know, it's cool for, you know, our neighbors if we've got Longfellow, North High Park, um, um, you know, lots of little neighborhoods around us. And, uh, you know, you'll see families walking over. And the first time we had it, they were just like ecstatic. They didn't have anything at that at that intersection or anything nearby to they didn't have a reason to roll out of their beds on a Saturday and come and see what's going on in the neighborhood. So you kind of see people are excited, you know, that. Um, and other programming, you know, we have each individual small business or nonprofit. So Maker Village, A16 Bike Collective, um, we've got uh, Oddities Prints, we've got Two Tone Press. A lot of these do, you know, their own programming. And next year we're going to try to tie in and do a three part series where you make, make paper because we have a paper maker in our neighborhood. Um, you make paper and then you go to the letterpress shop, you print on it, you know traditional letterpress and then come over to Maker Village and make a wooden frame. So you kind of do, um, you know, tie in all the organizations with the program and kind of, again, we're, we're playing to our strengths as kind of a maker, little DIY neighborhood. Um, but we are a, um, we are definitely an amenity for the other uh, uh, developments around. And we know that. So, you know, we, we work with the developers on you know, at least communicating, I would say work with, but we communicate and do things that are in both of our interests. Reverse it for parking would be one example of that. We work with Butch Rigby, which, you know, bought a building, which is now where uh, urban mining and smart, smart schools, Casey, and a bunch of other nonprofits are in. And, you know, uh, we work together to get reverse it for parking, which added a bunch of parking in the neighborhood and calmed the it will come the traffic it hasn't been done yet, but um, you know we, we want to. Even though we're DIY, nonprofit, small businesses, you know, fighting the man a little bit. We want to work. <laughs> we want to work with the big institutions um, to make sure you know um, they're not overstepping, and that you know we can get things done where we have common interests. Sure. Uh, yeah, so I mentioned that. I'm sorry, really quick. Um, I think there's a few conversations that's being had. I think we talk about innovation. We really talk about the divide between the uh, truth, the east side, and the, the, the west, the corner of the west. Um, I think it's important to to also note that uh, direct engagement of the community that we're trying to include in these uh, these innovations uh, is needs to be more intentional. Um, I don't think, I think we are good at doing what we do amongst the people that we're comfortable doing it with. Um, I think that there's a stretch to actually um, acclimate or un uh, help others understand uh, what it is. And it, it, it's an uphill task and battle, right? Because we all say this is an open door, anybody's invited. However, uh, cultural weaknesses <coughs> are going to keep people away. Right, regardless of how open that we are, I think cultural differences keep people away. And uh, so I just, I, I think I wanted, I just wanted to state that because, and then also when we talk about success, gaining success, there's a traditional way of success, and then there's a non-traditional way. So when we talk about non-traditional, we're talking about uh, mom and pop entrepreneurs that, uh, you know, they might not see fifty thousand dollars or a hundred thousand dollars or a million dollars. And growth in, the, in a certain period of time. Uh, you might only see 20,000 or 10,000 uh, in growth. Non traditional, that's a huge success for that, for that uh, demographic, right? Uh, however, they're kind of written off as, you know, hobbies or, or whatever the case may be. So I think that we need to start thinking about reframing what traditional versus non traditional is, and then also crossing those lines intentionally to make sure that we're bringing in the folks. That actually live in these neighborhoods that we're trying to infiltrate and, and organically uh, create. So you raised really strong points that um, trying to address. Like Anika pointed out, just how you bumped into global entrepreneurship when you did. So that somehow uh, talking with people down in the community and you know, basically sourcing staff, UBC staff will I think, support this assertion that. It's kind of like no matter where I am in the city, Northland, South, East Side, downtown, there is a big lack of awareness of just the services that you see, basically, so it's like the city 
case of this care would provide. But then there's a specific um, feeling that these services aren't for me. They may have some for some of the but we're really trying to find ways to change. And, um, I mentioned uh, the library, Woodford Library. I, I have office hours there uh, for money every month to bring at least some of City Hall to the Costa Quarter. But it, it's an ongoing challenge. Right? Um, and I mentioned D. Weiser Dixon uh, was here in You've been working on uh, Enterprise Village uh, for quite some time. So you, you kind of heard the questions that have come up. What, uh, is it, is it, is it a thumbnail sketch of the concept? And, uh, yeah, I appreciate uh, Rick was over to my home last week and he kind of said, you might want to sit in. And a good friend of mine that uh, met you, Kevin, the other thing, Chair of the State. Um, everything that he is saying is so right on point. Uh, I've been sort of like underground, I'm not going to say underground, but uh, working on a project that would address the gentleman that just spoke right there uh, about inclusive competitiveness. I, pictures are worth a thousand words. So it's better I can show you guys a picture of what the enterprise village is. Uh, when you kind of look at this area right here, that's right next to the Historic Jazz District on 18th and uh, One of the amenities that uh, Enterprise Village has is Lincoln High School is the number one school in the state. Then we've got uh, abandoned high schools, not abandoned, but this year, this high school is going to be repurposed for innovation, for science, technology, engineering, math. So, and then you have uh, urban neighborhood pattern which is a uh, Cleaver School, and they're focusing in on STEM. So just to show you <clears throat> what the idea was, where you're prepared, you, you can come, <laughs> and, you know, and, and be being inclusive as an African American in diversity. Uh, you can actually start off the cradle, and then go all the way to, you know, the really, the community really is this is land, real estate, really conducive to when you create your own uh, ecosystem, uh, which back in the day, in the 40s and 50s, where African Americans were actually the, the only place that they go shop, live, and work and play. So we're trying to recreate that today with a uh, focus on uh, STEM. So you can actually be born there, walk there, go to all the schools that already existed. And uh, we have the one thing I think that we have to do new construction because it's all ground. We come up from the ground. There's no buildings, there's no thing. Probably everybody sees the uh, castle. That's probably the only building and the existing school, but everything else is flat ground. Can I trust your comment? I, I mean, oh, I'm sorry. I think it's probably <laughs> the most important thing that's been said in the room. Um, and I want to make sure that we address it a couple different ways. I want to start with the back end of what you said, though, around Main Street entrepreneurship versus high growth entrepreneurship. I, I sense in the community, having been driving innovation, driving entrepreneurial engagement, driving corporate engagement, um, working with Casey SourceLink for a, a long time now, I, I sense in this community that there's this belief that if you do one, you're not paying attention to the other, or if, if you're not acknowledging that, you know, new job starts come from Main Street entrepreneurs, then you're not doing a service to the community and so on. I don't think these things have to be mutually exclusive. And the way that we think about them, um, right or wrong, is um, if you're not bringing resources into the community, if you're not exporting services as a region and bringing revenue into the larger Kansas City region, Main Street entrepreneurs will not survive. They, they just, they, there is no ecosystem that just exchanges dollars because dollars are leaving the community so we have to make sure that we're bringing dollars into the community somehow so we're trying to focus on that piece there's a lot of things that you know, we're three years away from the new building and so we want to focus on a lot of early stage programming and main street entrepreneurial programming uh, and, and a lot of things to really drive that that um that gap that you're talking about drive it closer together so it's not perceived as a gap so much so very aware of that. On the community engagement piece, um, couldn't agree more. 
open to suggestions. I, I, I think you guys are noted. I met with Carrie. I met with a lot of people trying to do one-on-one -on -one community engagement. We're going to do some more formal community engagement before we put the shovel in any in the ground anywhere. Um, and so I think that if you're not engaged in your local community, doesn't matter if it's a larger economic regional development uh, initiative, you're going to miss the point. I think that's where we've seen success or failure amongst these innovation districts is the ones that don't do what you're saying, they fail or they struggle. I don't think that that's, that's at all what we want to do. So I'm open to suggestions. We'll give anybody my email address, my phone number, call me, uh, tweet at me, do whatever. Um, we'd love to chat with folks about how we make this as successful for Kansas City and in particular the surrounding area. Question. Um, so basically, what you're saying is you guys who don't have any tools in how to address the cultural racism tools that you're trying to get. Um, the pilot is going to sit on a very, very sensitive line. Um, and I think what the gentleman is trying to say is what, what do you actually want to do? In terms of say, this is going to be a simple morning between engagement. What are you doing to actually make sure that this is right? So, with, in which you're trying to connect between the people and the crossroads, on the labor and bond side, how are you going to engage with like, that? How are you going to build wealth amongst the community so that we can create our own jobs and build amongst ourselves? I think it's, it's as someone who's from the east side, who works for a company that's on the east side, I get very scared when you see these big innovative ideas come so close, especially at a time of gentrification, because the, the first thing I want to know is what are you doing to help my side of the community besides laying a pathway for gentrification? If I know this side of the community has all the resources to gear up and push out, and like you said, this is a real estate type city, what is going to stop you guys from coming in, putting people in, pushing them over, and overthrowing us because we're not ready? We don't have the resources. So people always say, we want to get the resources, we want to come out, we want to be community engaged and talk to us. We should engage us or pull us in by being very specific about the programming and the things that you can do. So it's one thing to talk about it. It's another thing to say, I'm going to be very intentional about making sure I grow black businesses and create more jobs to help combat the issues that this community has. So I, I didn't really hear an answer out of you on that one. Uh, and then for Mr. Dixon, uh, you have a great idea and concept. How are you going to make sure that black businesses can actually thrive in the community that once was a black Wall Street mm -hmm. I, I mean, I. It's hard to answer in a form like this, but there are some ideas around how we build specific programming. We'd love to talk about including accelerators, some of the mentors that we want to bring in. I, I'm not, I'm not going to suggest that I'm bringing a bunch of Overland Park executives in to mentor the black community. And that's not what, what I'm saying, and that's not no, what no, I'm trying I, to I, do. No, I mean, not saying. So I just want to make sure that, that when I when I give general statements about community engagement is because it's not, we're not there yet. And I'm not suggesting that we have the answers. Mm -hmm. And I also, um, you made a comment that I've been trying to overcome since the day we made our announcement. Mm -hmm. so we're not trying to connect anything. Okay. There, is no, there, was a, there was a quote in the yeah. article about connecting. My, my goal isn't to connect anything. Like I said, this is a larger regional economic development opportunity. Yeah. You used the term front door. Mm -hmm. What we're trying to create, what I'm trying to create, is a front door to the regional economy and innovation network. When you're outside this community, outside the larger Kansas City community, and you ask people about bringing resources to Kansas City, Google for entrepreneurs. We've had a we've had many conversations over the last six years <coughs> with diversity-led programming that doesn't know where to go in Kansas City. They'll be like, where? You're spread out. Like it would be hard for us to invest in your yourself as a community. What we're trying to create this place, the front door to the regional economy. Now it happens to be, and you're right, I probably picked the most sensitive corridor in all of Kansas City, and I'm willing to take that VHAG on and just see if, it, if we can make it work. But it's not going to be without proactive key engagement. So I don't have all the answers. I'm not going to profess to have all the answers. There is a, a series of initial diversity programming pieces and community engagement programming that we plan to to initiate, we haven't talked about that yet. We haven't talked about any of our programming yet. The only reason we made an announcement is because our first parcel of land got secured. We wanted to make sure it wasn't about that first parcel of land, but it was about the larger opportunity that we're trying to create. So that, that's our perspective. So I, I, I'm not going to say I have all the answers, but certainly are aware of a lot of the issues that you're on. So suggestion, um, pull away from the word diversity, uh, including things that's very specific. You are at the line, borderline, of a very prominent community and a very um, 
trying to drive black people. Be very specific and intentional who you want to serve, who you're trying to serve, or understanding who you're going to be bumping up against. Um, and you are at a sensitive line that is going to be connected. So always be aware of that when you're doing what you're doing. It's probably the best advice I can give And engaging people like the Robinson next to you already on the cover are doing exactly that. How can she become a part of that in helping to engage more businesses to be part of the contest and be part of the uh, one of the initiatives uh, that we are doing for the homeowners that we uh, live there, buy a home there, and I would say in this and middle, we won't be, you know, we're not about gentrification, is that uh, because Google will run straight down our uh, pipeline, mm -hmm. the, head, the head end of it, and then the new technology that you'll be able to, we're going to be able to empower those homeowners <coughs> with. Uh, online businesses, whether it be their own home-based business or whether they can work online. Then we have UNKC who signed up maybe two years ago to bring in workforce development that giving us letters of support. Uh, Avila has given us letters of support. Uh, Lincoln has given us letters of support to come in and really put the program in there for diversity or inclusive competitive for people of our color to see our welcome Kevin uh, project. If you look at it geographically, you, you know, you've got the perfect location or whatever. So now, coming back to our side, which is a half a mile later, if we can get the programming ready and demand some of these educational institutions to come in and put uh, workforce development type programming on the property that we have and on the buildings that we plan to design, it would be a feeder, a direct feeder. To uh, what Kevin will be doing in about three, four, or five years. So it would be important for you and the young man and our, you know, to come in and share right knowledge that you guys want to see, especially with me, you know, because I grew up there, I lived there, from every walk to every school there. And so I'm back to try to make a difference. So we need to know what, what you guys are doing. But we'll have a program. That's what we're working on right now. And I just named a few and I can send you the letters of support. Send you know, George Shields here giving us some support. So we're on the next step now of getting funding, the opportunity zone. Yeah. 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 Y
opportunity zones, uh, the, the city has like 31, I think. You know, is there, uh, opportunities yeah, on the Treasury has approved. Um, tomorrow, I have a, another discussion that everyone might want to join on the Kansas City Entrepreneur Ecosystem Strategic Plan. Really, more how this community can help inform City Hall on how to engage in entrepreneurship. Great, but is there, an, is there an active investment with each one of your deals that someone can participate in today? Right, so what I'm getting at is part of the Opportunity Zone program is that Kaufman is helping us develop an Opportunity Zone prospectus. And that prospectus would start with uh, like an overarching why Kansas City response for everyone outside of Kansas City to understand what we've got going on here. And then each project can connect and kind of add living a bit here, but what I'm seeing is that each project can connect their specific offer that might be Opportunity Zone eligible to investors through, uh, through this network. Uh, opportunity Zones are uh, way be difficult for cities to manage, mainly because capital gains investors can declare themselves to be an opportunity zone without coming through a government agency. It is basically, from what I understand, declared on their taxes. So we're trying to create this marketplace idea. Yes? Okay. Yeah, can we have some last talk about our opportunity zones? Yeah. You can't stop them, you can't stand in between them. And, and I appreciate the efforts of the chamber and the city and Kaufman to try to create uh, a, a, an opportunity to engage those investments and engage those things from a community perspective. You have to be really careful about opportunity zones because you can't you can't set bureaucracy over the top of them in hopes to contain it because then you go against the very nature of what it's trying to incent, which is the investment. We have to be really, really careful about this. The answer to your question is, I don't know, I'm encouraging Kaufman to think twice about being the entity that creates the perspectives. I think the city is the one that needs to do that. Yeah, it's, um, it's but creating any like steps to engage before you can invest in an opportunity zone is very dangerous for this community. And, and I, I say that as I understand the challenges in being someone who's building an opportunity zone and community engagement, those, those perceptions and those things that can be created. And um, it's a great opportunity for Kansas City. We have a huge amount of land. You say 31 parcels. It covers census tracks. It, goes, it covers a huge census amount of land. Tracks. And we have some yeah. Yeah, there's a lot of opportunity, but we have to figure out. I think the best thing that came out of the forums last week was we have to create a couple nodes to <coughs> test and experiment with and yeah. see how this works. And I think um, that so, so the city's approach really is a, is a yes and approach. That it's like yes, opportunity zones create an investment opportunity, and the city can couple other investment uh, incentives along with that. Because we know that, like I'm sure, you know, the developers in the room, you, know, you, don't, you don't fund your project through one source. There's multiple sources and uses of those funds. And, um, and also to give the city an opportunity to make the goals that we have as a community visible to those investors so that we have really more of the outcomes desired by Opportunity Zones uh, legislation. Is it, what's next for, for each of you? What's next for you? Um, so, so right now, the as I said, the goal is to have a place, but in lieu of a place, where's Eastside Collaborative if we don't have a space? And Eastside Collaborative is poised to be a convener um, of Black entrepreneurs. So that's what it's trying to understand the needs of the community and represent those. What's next for Keystone? Um, yeah, so the, the first step for us is to nail down some of the anchor institutions to get our money use or to consent um, to make sure that we get the commitments from, from them. Um, we have verbal commitments, we have money use with most of them, but we need to nail it down to make it more, more official. Um, the second piece is the community engagement aspects. We're, we're in the middle of doing a lot of one-on-one -on -one conversations, but we really need to kind of ratchet that up. Uh, I think it's been highlighted here, but it's certainly one of the top two things on my list right now. And then the 
third thing is we have space that's available along the corridor that we want to line up programming out, especially thinking about bright, shiny buildings. Uh, a key success criteria to these innovation districts is to be authentic uh, and, and to be inspirational. I think there's some programming that we can bring to bear before there's a shovel in the ground anywhere. And that's kind of next up for us is to get some of that programming started uh, as soon as the first quarter of 2019. I don't run the neighborhood, so you know, <laughs> uh, the, next, uh, the next group, you know, the meeting, and uh, we pick up trash, people will talk about what they want to do, and move on to the next <laughs> right, right, right. So I had uh, initially thinking about how we might run this group, with, I had this idea that we might break up into smaller groups, and I do that so that, you know, everyone has an opportunity to speak in a group this size, so, so, uh, if there are the, that question you're like, which I ask, you know, you can, you can tweet me later or you can ask now if you have um, a question that's uh, sitting in your mind. So I uh, want to share with you. Yes, sir. Sure. Um, so just, just for each of you, uh, I'm the chair of the land bank at Kansas City, Missouri. Um, and we are talking about um, concerns about gentrification, working with neighborhoods, working with uh, people to bring uh, businesses. I have not heard of this until mm -hmm. today. Um, and that that concerns me for two reasons. One, I haven't heard of it, and two, I didn't know to look for it. Um, so I'm educating myself today, but I'm hoping that maybe we can have a conversation afterwards because uh, Land Bank has commercial property, um, and we also have vacant lots. Uh, we've been doing initiatives with um, urban farming um, and also with a couple of entrepreneurial groups uh, to kind of get things going, but uh, to know um, what what my goal when I took over as chair was to just work with the, the city and the county to look at the neighborhoods that the schools needed to do well. Because I, my belief is that the schools do well, we all do well. Um, but then now I know that this might be right down the street. Um, one of the things that we try to guard against when we guard against um, uh, is people speculating in real estate or just buying a bunch of houses. Now I know this is going on in that neighborhood. I can kind of we can put a you know something in the file say hey if someone wants to buy seven houses on this block there's a reason you know we need to kind of be be aware of that so um if i could talk to you guys afterwards you know, and just know that would be great. Yeah. Yeah. you just to answer your question uh the land bank has been very supportive of our with you know they just did a, yes, they just gave us a bunch of land yeah, exactly. So, um, if you really look at the closing thoughts, um, I, I think that uh, I appreciate everyone attending and, and certainly want to keep this conversation going. And it's kind of why we, we get out and talk about these things so that some of you will go, wow, it's the first I heard of this. What can I bring to the table? So I appreciate that. And uh, it's, it's aptly titled, I think, Emerging Innovation Districts. So, you know, this, this, these concepts have been percolating for a while, but... Uh, we've, we've got Small Business Saturday coming up in our neighborhood. Um, Cherry Pit is organizing, and a handful of other uh, organizations will be opening up. So if you're interested in being a vendor or coming and just checking out what's going on, um, I think it's the sun, last Sunday of November. This month, right? No. Last Saturday. You know what it is? Yeah, the next one is Saturday. Last question. You might look at the screen and see if someone on Facebook Live has a question there. Is there some comments that look like a popular? Just viewers. I don't see any questions. No questions. Okay. Well, thanks for watching on Facebook Live. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Yeah.